I have fixed the audio problem. I know so many people did not like that. I messed up. So the audio has been fixed. So I've also added a few additional clips here and going to talk about a few things at the end of this. So all I want you to do here is pay attention to a few things you can see here on the screen. This over to the left is Jenny's six pack in her airplane. And I want you to pay attention to the vertical speed indicator, which is right here, the VSI. And then I want you to pay attention to the Century 2000 autopilot over here on the right. And look for flashing going on. That means it's out of trim. The, the, the manual trim of the airplane is out of trim with what the autopilot's doing. The autopilot wants the airplane to be trimmed out. So I want you to pay attention to that. And then if you see here in the center, this is the cockpit of our F-35 Bonanza back when we had it. And I want to show you where the trim wheel is. And you can see where I'm circling that. Let me show you another picture here. Uh, this is a similar cockpit. This is a debonair, but you see the trim wheel. Uh, so I just want to make sure that um, you're paying attention to that as well, because you're not going to see it, but you'll see your hand in there. So it's just make some observations, and uh, and then the rest of the video will play. And then I am just going to talk about a few things that we didn't talk about uh, in the first one at the end. So, okay, so we're going to roll it here. Here you go. To turn it on. And... Navigation. It's supposed to pick up. Oh, the uh, the course line you made. Yeah, I see. I don't know if she's gonna do that or not. Well, let's turn back to the right. Probably too much, too, pretty a harsh turn there. Let's turn back to the right here. Want to kind of get it, get it where it can capture it. I don't know if I have this set up right. There it goes. Oh, I had it on the wrong setting. That's that's why. Downtown traffic one nine seven one zero five miles to the northeast of downtown island at three thousand five hundred feet. That means maneuvering three thousand five hundred to the surface. Is it taking you to the left? I was like, this is this is showing like a, a north course, which is not what we want. Was it taking you to the left? Yes, it was. I need to get back on track here. That's all good. So I think we'll have to change something here. Because this this should be pulling in information. You know, you could just tune this course like whatever. But, I mean, we could... Now, when it says ATT, what is that talking about? Um, it's not attitude, is it? It... I forgot what it meant. I just know that um, once we get at the altitude, I just know we hit... Uh, that button. Oh, okay, gotcha. I think I think we might have to adjust the trim up, um, so it kind of it'll kind of help. And I don't know if we need to if you ever increase power for a cruise power setting, or sorry for a, for a climb type thing. Cruise them. Because I think whenever whenever I was doing that, it was kind of thinking it was kind of thinking. Uh, we'll throw that to 65. He was thinking that we were getting a little slower, so maybe it was like it was coming back down because and maybe we wasn't able to hold it because now it's still increasing up there a thousand. And it was just it was there it keeps going higher and higher. So like if we if we add more power, we can get more climb out of it. Is what I'm thinking. We had to just had to trim it. It said trim up every once in a while or back back when I before I trimmed it. Yeah, hey, I've, I've got it on uh, 21 right now. So that's gallons per hour. You, this is our yeah, manifold pressure. Yeah, I, I right, added it. You told me to add more power, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't know. Me. Okay. It didn't really help that that much, though. Well, it looks like we're... If we're looking here... Well, yeah. I think it's helping, because it keeps wanting... Back when before we did that, it kept wanting to come back down. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. All right, we're still going. We're still climbing. 70, 71. Maybe I should, uh, watch it's going 69. I need a problem. I need to kind of, I need to, um. Well, it won't, it won't ever let you stall. It's holding there at VX is fine. Like, that will climb it just pretty well. Okay. It's, because it seems about, you know, 630, 
Like if it, it if it thinks that it's going to, you know, descend, then it or, or stall, then it, that that's when it's going to let its nose back down. Okay. Trim down. So I had it. We had it set to trim up. So now let's roll it this way. Now it's zero there. D is a little bit that way. Still wants a little bit more trim down. So then we'll scroll it there. See what that says. Yeah, it kind of went to 6600. Let me take it down to a notch. I think it it might come back down by itself. Is is the power set to a good descent? Would you say? Uh, I would say maybe we could pull keep pulling some more power. 27. Now it's saying every once in a while maybe trim up a little bit. Do we want to? Do you want to set it back to ground neutral? I'm about to cut it off at 2500 anyway. Well, this is trim still for us to control it. It'll make it easier the other way. So roll the bar further. Yeah, like that. That'll oh. All right, I'm cutting the autopilot off. Okay. All right. Now you fly it down. Yep. To so 2,000. We're looking here. Yep. Back to the right some. Because this is oh, the same yeah, way you go back to the right. Follow That's the right. needle. Yep. Just a little small, small corrections, right? 10 degrees. Yeah. I'd say at this point, try and be less than five. We'll, we'll power out maybe. We're a little fast at 105, I think. Turn this up. Hey everyone. So the NTSB preliminary report for the crash of November 5891 Juliet, um, Jenny Blaylock's airplane is out and it is chilling. Um, I'm going to read this to you and then we can talk about it and there's a factor in here that I think was the final straw and let's get into it so on December 7th 2023 at 11:03 central standard time a beach 35 c 33 it's a debonair November 5891 Juliet was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Pulaski Tennessee the private pilot and passenger sustained fatal injuries the airplane was operated as a Title 14 code of the Federal Regulations Part 91 personal flight, just a GA flight. The flight originated from Knoxville Downtown Island Airport, Knoxville, Tennessee, that was her home airport, at about 9.48 Central Standard Time, and was en route to Saline County Regional Airport, Benton, Arkansas. Preliminary Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB data, revealed that after takeoff, from Knoxville Downtown Airport, the airplane climbed and turned to a ground track of 255 degrees, then leveled off for about 12 minutes at 2,500 feet, mean sea level, before climbing to 6,400 feet. The pilot was in contact with air traffic control and had requested flight following services. This, I think, put it over the top. As the flight was about 140 nautical miles into the trip, the controller advised the pilot that she was left of course. The pilot acknowledged and responded that she was correcting. At about 10.19, the airplane entered the first of a series of climbs and descents with corresponding fluctuations in its observed ground speed. During these oscillations, which varied in magnitude, the airplane's altitude varied between about 6,400 feet and about 5,300 feet. About 10.57, the airplane entered a descent that arrested about 4,300 feet at a ground speed of 143 knots, after which it climbed to 6,050 feet and slowed to 85 knots. The airplane then began to descend rapidly before ADSB contact was lost in the vicinity of the accident site. During the last several seconds of the flight, the airplane was on a ground track of 262 degrees descending at a ground speed that reached a maximum of 228 knots, and the estimated maximum descent rate was about 11,900 feet per minute. During these altitude fluctuations, the controller twice provided instructions to the pilot to contact the Memphis Air Route Traffic Control Center, However, neither of the instructions were acknowledged by the pilot. During the final moments of the flight, a faint communication from the pilot stating the airplane's registration and debonair, followed by an emergency declaration and an unintelligible word. About 60 seconds later, a faint and largely unintelligible transmission from the passenger was transmitted. 
The controller's subsequent attempts to contact the pilot were unanswered, and there were no further communications from either the pilot or passenger. The airplane impacted hilly, wooded terrain at an elevation of 971 feet with the wreckage path oriented on a heading of about 268 degrees magnetic. The wreckage was highly fragmented, and the debris field extended in a fan-like pattern about 300 feet long. The tops of several trees leading to the main wreckage were cut off at, a progressively, at progressively lower heights leading up to the main impact with the ground. During the accident sequence, the fuel tanks were breached and a post-impact fire spread in the vicinity of the wreckage to the surrounding trees and undergrowth. A witness in the vicinity of the accident site stated that the airplane flew overhead at a high rate of speed and described the engine was running when it impacted the ground. All major components of the airplane were located at the accident site. The engine was partially buried in a crater that was 5 feet deep by 8 feet wide. The engine was severely damaged by impact forces and crankshaft continuity and cylinder compression could not be confirmed due to the internal impact damage. The magneto key was broken off in the switch and set at both. Both magnetos separated from the engine during the accident sequence were damaged by impact forces and could not be functionally tested. The spark plugs were impacted, the spark plugs, sorry, were impact damaged but showed minimal wear when compared to the Champion Check A plug chart and did not display any evidence of carbon or lead fouling. The propeller blades separated from the hub during the impact sequence. One blade was buried in the impact crater while the opposing blade was found 30 feet west of the main wreckage. The buried blade exhibited a significant bend with cord-wise scraping and, a lead and leading edge gouges. The opposite blade had a slight bend and also exhibited cord-wise scraping. The propeller hub showed rotational crushing damage. There was no evidence of an in-flight fire. The flight control system components from the cockpit to all control surfaces were significantly damaged or destroyed by impact forces and the post-impact fire. Flight control continuity could not be established. However, all observed breaks of the flight control cables displayed fracture features that were indicative of tensile overload, having broom straw appearances consistent with impact-related separation. The, ele the elevator trim was measured and correlated to about 5 degrees of trim tab deflection in the nose-down direction. The rudder, left horizontal stabilizer, and elevator remained attached to the epinage and were free to move when manually manipulated. The cockpit was destroyed by impact forces and fire, and no flight instrumentation or gauges could be identified or recovered. The airplane was equipped with a Century 2000 autopilot, and while the instrument panel faceplate was identified, no settings of the autopilot could be determined. The autopilot servos were damaged by impact and fire. The wreckage, including two intact digital video recording devices, were retained for further examination. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, the question marks that we had had prior were, could this have been carbon monoxide poisoning? Could there have been a medical emergency like a heart attack or a stroke? Could there have been a control cable failure of some kind related to the autopilot or related to just flight control systems in general? Well, that's now been eliminated. And what this tells us is when you have your compounding factors that lead to an accident what we have here is for over a year she was flying with her glass so to speak like right at the brim when you are talking about checks a check would be like single engine flying at night or sing or two checks would be single engine flying at night and imc as an example okay and so she basically had three major things that i would consider checks one, she did not know how to use this autopilot and was continuously out of trim, and so the autopilot's fighting it, and she was absolutely confused by it. Secondly, the airplane was far, far too complex for her, and she was so far behind the airplane um, that it, it just created mass confusion for her. She, she couldn't use just the basic six-pack on the airplane, and then there's when I went back and reviewed these uh, these flights, I mean, there's so many countless things, and you're going to see some of that coming up just briefly. I'm going to show you some ATC communication. So we've eliminated 
control cable. We've eliminated medical emergency. We've eliminated carbon monoxide. It's basically a loss of control, the final factor being her in contact with ATC. So the, what the flight following did, and if you watch any of her, any of her uh, videos where she has a CFI with her and sh they're shooting instrument approaches, she's, she's, she's out of it. She's, she's, and I'm going to show you this in a second. She's just it's so far beyond her this is so unfair to her um the cfi is in my opinion it's criminal it's just how how in the world i mean how could you allow that uh, i mean you got to say something i mean it's it's you know borderline absurd really and now here she is in contact with atc i could find no flights where she ever was in contact with atc without her cfi this is also the longest flight i could find going back three months all the way to september and if you look here we can go let's bring this over and i'll show you um so more flight history so so if we look at all these flights and this is, goes all the way back to september 21st and uh, the longest one looks like maybe an hour well no i mean an hour uh, 13 minutes an hour and 26 minutes and these were um flights that were knoxville you know downtown and back you know um these were basically just you know training circuits uh that she was doing you can see here so so not only is she talking in to atc with flight following she doesn't have a cfi with her and this is the longest flight that she's done in in a long it will at least three months right so uh that factor she got crossed up and totally confused and you could and you could tell that from reading that and that was the final factor that just overflowed the glass so i want you to watch this uh flight november 5 8 9 or 1 juliet check out to the immediately we're showing 1500 roger that looking i know what you yeah. ignite the power lit there November 5891, Juliet, cancel approach clearance, turn right head, I maintain uh, 2500, turn right heading 130. Right heading 150 up to 3500, Nano Juliet. Alright, full power. He's, hey, I guess he saw that we were too low or something. Full power for me? Yep, it's full power. Yeah, and then let's go right, turn right heading 150. And just notice here, you know, they're, they're, uh, on the go, they're doing a missed approach, and the flaps are still down. November 91, Juliet, do you require any assistance? No, um, we're doing some IFR um, instrument practice for rating. Uh, we, I mean, may have missed a little point there, but we didn't see anything. Issue, no, no, no issues here. November uh, 91, Juliet, we're showing you about uh, 900 feet below the crossing altitude from Aldi. Uh, were we past Aldi at the point? Sorry about that. I guess we may have been a little low there. 91, Juliet. She is so far behind, it's just not registering. It just makes no sense to her whatsoever. It's like reading directions to build something in a different language. I mean, these CFIs, I mean, it's got to be better than this. It has to be better than this. They, they have means to do things to prevent people from flying. I mean, they do, there are means there. And... Um, you know, there's a there's a standard, and if it's not met, the CFI can can do something about it. Um, boy, oh boy. Okay. So to just wrap up with you, the only thing we can honestly do is learn from this, as you all know. But I did want to mention pilot-induced pressure. Pilot-induced pressure, uh, I believe, was a factor. Uh, that is something I did not discuss with you before. But as I got to looking at this, I'm you know this is an observation. But normally she did not contact, as we discussed, uh, ATC for flight following when she wasn't with an instructor. This is a three-hour flight. She wanted to get these avionics put in. So it's possible she felt pressure to do this flight, and maybe she didn't feel up to doing the flight. Um, you know, that that is a factor in relation to the whole, you know, get-home-itis um, is a real thing. You know, I've got a job, I've got to get to that, 
all kinds of different pilot induced pressures and it is a real factor and so just something I wanted to mention the cameras in the cockpit is something a lot of you brought up and uh, I agree with that I I would think that it would be a logical best practice for CFIs to not allow cameras in the cockpit as your own personal decision as a CFI. I'm not saying there should be a law against it. Uh, that, that can get really convoluted. But I would say that if this became an out-of-hand situation where the NTSB was finding accidents that they felt that was a major factor, well, you could see that occurring. This is this is a very, very extreme example of poor airmanship across the board by all the parties involved in training Jenny uh, and allowing her to be in that situation because there has to we have to recognize that you know not all of us are going to be professional football players or singers or pilots and sometimes it's just not meant to be and you need to tell people the truth before something like this happens so that is really a lesson here in my opinion as far as i did have questions about carbon monoxide poisoning there's a really good video about that in the aviation safety network on youtube where a gentleman in a mooney actually got carbon monoxide poisoning he passed out and the airplane went in but he survived he hardly even got hurt it's, it's an amazing story but I really don't believe carbon monoxide poisoning even could have been a factor because you will not know that you've you've got uh, that uh, carbon monoxide coming into the cockpit. You know, you pass out first. It's almost I mean, it's almost think of it like hypoxia. So I just think that all these factors that we talk about compounded to bring her fear level up into a point where any instincts that she did have, which we know she didn't instinctively you know her airmanship was not instinctive which is really critical if you're going to fly airplanes safely it's a three-dimensional sphere around you and you have to be able to multitask multi things you have to you have to know things that you might not know in relation to potentially what the gauges are doing what your power settings are what your trim you have to there's a lot of feel involved in that in conjunction with using your instrumentation, your communications with ATC, any kind of CRM that you might be doing in the airplane, which was something that that's all my entire experience has been because I was never a licensed pilot. I was always the guy in the right seat, co-pilot, or whatever you want to call me, pinch hitter. Um, so I don't know anything differently than flying with, you know, my dad and so um but we worked very very well together and i know in complex situations and high workload environments for him i was able to ease that take the airplane we had a very very uh, awesome relationship that way flying together and uh and had a sterile cockpit um, it was definitely one thing that i noticed in this and uh, a sterile cockpit is something i think that when you have cameras in there especially with these young pilots that is uh, that's going to affect uh, a sterile cockpit and i think that's a best practice as well I, I really do as all of you have commented and i've seen so many of you comment about that and i really thought about what you said and i do agree that 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 is much more of a distraction than than i guess i really thought about and and watching this and thinking about what you all have said about other you know, it, it it is a factor, and, you know, we have had our YouTube channel for years, and um, we've had GoPro cameras for years, and that wasn't something we ever did. We just, and I didn't really have a big conversation with Dad about it, but it was just, I didn't like the idea myself personally of trying to hook all these things up and worrying about them and, you know, doing the handheld cameras every once in a while um, or our phone or something, you know, at random was fine and no big deal. And you guys have seen some of that footage and it's horrible. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm done rambling because I'm a rambler. But uh, I hope this this video improved and maybe you saw a few, you know, things that you hadn't before. And, and we'll see you guys later. Thank you so much.